Hello there, everyone, and welcome to our webinar tonight about the mysterious respiratory illness and additionally a discussion about CIRDC. Now, we have an amazing group of people that are here. We had nearly 600 registrations. So tell me that this is not an important subject in the pet industry right now, right? So we have upped our numbers. Everybody can come on here to ask questions. And it looks like even at this early stage, we already have over 200 people that are here with us. So uh, loving looking through everybody putting their names in here. We have a lot of boarding and daycare. Uh, we have some uh, registered technicians, a lot of veterinary clinics that are in here also. Um, I see a lot of pet sitters and dog walkers. So I'm excited and you are all over the board. So we appreciate you so much coming on and joining us tonight. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Janie Budnick and I am a board member of PAC. And if you're not familiar with PAC, that is the Professional Animal Care Certification Council. And I just wanted to take a little opportunity here at the beginning to familiarize some of you partners that have joined us of specifically what PAC is. So first of all, a PAC's mission is really to bring independent testing and certification to the pet care industry. Now, this is not something that we've actually had in the care space, having that independent testing. Uh, there are a lot of certification bodies that will educate you and will provide you with a certification. But PAC is specifically here as a third party certification body to test your knowledge and develop standards for the actual pet care industry. It is, I can tell you quite the test, anyone that has taken this, uh, this exam. It is a three-year certification and there are several different levels that you can take on the testing, but it really is based off of core values of humane pet care, animal welfare, and then of course we have our code of ethics. Those certification levels, we have three different ones. Uh, the first is the certified animal care provider, which is going to be the people doing the direct care typically in your facilities or your veterinary clinics. We do also have a manager level and we do have an operator level. Of course, uh, a lot of people don't understand why, why PAC why third-party certification. Of course, if you consider most, uh, most professional industries out there do have some form of certification. And as many of us know, there are no standards in the pet care industry. And without standards, there can be just dramatic results in, in care for the pets. And so th that is why PAC is restepping into be able to put approvals and standards on the, the facilities and the individuals out there who are providing care. So we are really engaging different uh, aspects of the pet industry to come alongside PAC and really up-level each other together. And so uh, we are also educating pet parents into the importance of having standardization of care. Several reasons that having the certification can be very important for your own pet business. Of course, as I mentioned, most professions do require some sort of independent certification. So it's about time for us to have those standards, especially for the pets themselves. Uh, we do have a very competitive market and this sets you up as a level above uh, possibly your competition or um, other people in your industry that might not be providing the same level of care that you know that you are committed to. Uh, we're all committed to excellent safety, making sure that we're providing the best care for the pets that are under our care. The wonderful, um, I can't really say side effect, but an additional benefit is how 
uh, this type of certification can really provide for your employees. It can show them that there is a career pathway within the industry by providing this education. It can up-level them also into seeing the importance of their own continuing education and their space within the industry. Yeah, you're going to have the ability to bring in a higher quality level of employee with this also. And more than anything, it is going to build trust with the pet parents that are in your community, which is so important to all of us. Just wanted to share with you the exam dates that we do have coming up. We are done with our testing windows for 2023. But in 2024, we have these three different testing windows. Uh, in March, June, and November. So I certainly invite you to uh, come check out uh, the Professional Animal Care Certification Council. Check out our website and uh, look into those exam dates and possibly find one that works for you. Would love to uh, answer anybody's questions. If you want to just contact us through that website, we would be happy to chat with you. So I do appreciate so much you coming in here. I know we have a lot of PAC certified individuals on the call also. Though. And uh, it's very exciting to us that we are able to bring Dr. Jen Chatfield in here to have this discussion. She, well, we were so fortunate that she came to us to be able to broadcast this for you. So, you know, as... As our body, as our organization, we are thrilled to be able to provide this kind of education for you. So I am going to go ahead and bring Dr. Jen up here on the screen with, oh my goodness. You Look know, I couldn't, I couldn't her. do this without well, that making an appearance. To do now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but she is going to get a treat and head out for her evening. Such That's all a beauty. Yes. That's all she could do. And um, yes. Cosette says hello to Lily. <laughs> Lily, the Frenchie, Eve, I know, is just in the chat telling me because Lily says hello. Um, yes, all the Frenchies know each other. It's true. I love it. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> the band. Okay. Definitely. So, well, wonderful. So I am so, so glad you are here. <laughs> yes. So I, you know, just a little bit of how housekeeping for everyone. I am, um, I'm going to be hopping off screen to let you do your presentation and everyone, she is going to stop occasionally for questions. So I'll just be watching on the side here for any specific questions you have so I can make sure that I bring them up to her. So she's not like, what am I looking at? Right. Cause that gets a little distracting. <laughs> Wonderful. So I am going to hop off here. Okay, she hopped off, so I think I hop in, um, and I'm so glad that you all are here. Thank you so much for taking some time to join us, especially with short notice. Um, I'm ever so thankful to PAC for putting this together and sponsoring it. I do see some questions in there. Kylie, I saw your question. Um, I know Eve had some questions. Um, so please, as your questions arise, type them in the box, and we'll try to get to all of them as we move through. But we have several hundred people um, who are on tonight from all over the world. I saw New Zealand, Australia, America, um, Canada, all different places. And so I'm super excited about that. We also have what I call my dream blended audience because we have almost the full pet care team. We have veterinarians, technicians, um, boarding kennels, groomers, trainers. We have everyone. Um, so I'm really excited about that because as some of you who know me personally know, it's sort of um, my soapbox issue to get the entire care team to start talking more often with each other. Okay, so I'm going to get started here. Um, we started out with this saying, why is um, canine infectious respiratory disease complex or CIRDC? Why is it so complicated or is it? And then this whole mystery like disease started sweeping through the media and I started getting a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails about it. And I said, holy moly, let, let's do something about that. So first of all, I do want to say thank you to IBPSA um, for pushing this out to all of their members. My veterinary friends, if you are not yet familiar with IBPSA and PAC, those are two different entities, 
make yourself aware of them um, and make yourself aware of whether or not the pet care facilities in your area are affiliated with IBPSA and if they have any PAC certified folks there. Additionally, I want to say thank you to Merck Animal Health. This evening's um, presentation and conversation is approved, race approved for um, veterinary CE for one hour. And that's thank you to Merck Animal Health. So this is not a Merck Animal Health sponsored webinar. However, they are providing that CE certification piece for us. And it is only available for live viewers. It will not be available. So if you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, you'll be smarter, you'll have more information, but you won't have an hour of CE credit. Okay, so, oh yeah, this is a reminder. This is to remind me um, to let you know about how all of this is working. So uh, no one's getting paid or making money here. Not me, not PAC, no one is. Everyone came together to put this together in short order in order to kind of get all of us in the industry on the same page, or at least talk about what's going on. And so I'm very thankful for that. So I have no conflict of interest. So in this case, he could be cute, but it's not complicated. Okay, so how are we gonna start this? I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about the breaking news. Um, we're gonna have a little bit of case-based discussion because I think, I know veterinarians like that, and I think that pet care um, professionals like it as well. And then we'll talk a little bit about canine respiratory infections and what do we do right meow, right now? Okay, so the breaking news, I feel like if you, unless you've been living under a rock, you have seen on news outlets who never talk about anything animal or pet related, you're hearing about some crazy new novel um, mystery respiratory um, infection that's killing dogs everywhere. I mean, that was like a headline I saw. Um, so what, like when you see that headline and you click on it, you start looking for, okay, what's really going on here? And let's talk about tonight what we know. What we know right now with what the, I, I'm not, it's hard for me not to put air quotes around it when I say mystery disease happening. Um, we know that no common pathogen has been determined to be producing the pathology or the disease in the dogs that have been tested so far. But the other interesting thing that is, um, that people are unaware of maybe, is that this is not new, that this event, so people who are labeling this as an event, they have been tracking it or following it for more than a year, okay? Um, and so for those of us who heard about it in just in the last few weeks, um, that, that, that's a very, to me, that's a very calming piece of information. Oh, well, I wasn't worried about it three months ago. Um, so what am I going to be worried about now? So we know it's apparently been going on for a while, whether we were aware of it or not. Okay. What does it look like? Well, there's a whole list of things. There's an entire list of things. And one of the struggles with this, typically when we talk about an outbreak of a disease, whether it's in people or animals, we develop what's called a case definition. And what that looks like is, um, so let's say it's, um, let's say it's a flu outbreak or um, uh, something like that. You'll say, well, it's a person um, in this, usually a geographical area where the outbreak has been happening. So where the disease is confirmed. So it's a person in any town USA um, that has these symptoms and this test result, right? That will be someone who meets the definition for a case to be considered included in that event. We don't have that for this. We're pretty far from that. There is no standard case definition yet. So that's why I say event with air quotes because what is the event? What is the, what are the cases that we're including or excluding? But some common clinical signs that people are talking about are just those that you're used to seeing with any respiratory infection in a dog, a cough. Now, some people are saying this is um, with this particular event, that it's a persistent cough that goes on for like three weeks or more. 
Here's a spoiler alert. There are common pathogens that can produce a cough in a dog for three weeks or more. Bordetella, anyone? Okay, so a cough, a fever, plus or minus a fever, doesn't have to have one, a dog that doesn't want to eat, uh, plus or minus nasal discharge, ocular discharge, plus or minus sneezing, the dog may be lethargic. If you're thinking to yourself, well, these are all symptoms of almost any dog that has a respiratory infection, how is this special? You're not alone, because that's what I'm thinking too. Uh, none of these really stand up as what we call a pathognomonic sign to indicate that they're part of this mystery event. These are the commonly reported, commonly accepted clinical signs for a dog with infectious respiratory disease. Okay. So where are we finding it? Well, here's all the states. Again, this is also a misnomer that you're seeing in the media. This in most places, this is not what we call a reportable disease. That means if a veterinarian finds it, we don't have to report it to anybody. And in point of fact, who would we report it to? Would we report it to our state vet? What are they going to do with that information? At this point, not a lot. Now, there are some states. Um, I think Colorado is putting together a program where they want people to um, actively report to the state veterinarian's office when they diagnose a case of respiratory disease. I hope their phones are ready. I hope they have a lot of telephone lines available for that. Or I hope their email filter is turned on so that they don't have to open all those. Because respiratory disease in dogs is really, really common. Yes, um, Vesna, I see that. Oregon is off of here. I don't know how I left Oregon off. Oregon's been big on this. Um, so, uh, and South Carolina, Reba, thanks for pointing that. But you see, there's if I put a list up there, and this is a list I just got, um, I put this together like two days ago, I put this list together. These are places that are published in the regular media as having been involved, okay? I think, I think you could almost put all 50 states. I hesitate to include Alaska and Hawaii, not because I don't love them, because I do, but because they are quite distant from the contiguous 48, and so it takes a little bit longer for diseases to spread there if they do. Okay, exactly, Jordan, what is making this disease any different from regular respiratory illness? That is my question. So if you're wondering about what test results have shown, well, your friend, Jen, I obtained the data from the last 12 months or so of respiratory PCR testing from one of the larger commercial labs. This is what it looks like. So if you look at the percentage of um, the percentage up the Y axis are uh, the percent of samples tested. Right. So, for instance, um, if we look at the Bordetella there, that second group, each bar, each colored bar is a different month in the last 12. And it looks like just under 15 percent is the highest. Um, and it looks like that was probably March of 2023, maybe. Um, so just under 15% of the respiratory uh, samples submitted for PCR tested positive for Bordetella. That's how this data works. Now, the most often diagnosed or confirmed with PCR is mycoplasma. I'm going to give a minute in case some of y'all want to put on your surprised face. You might want to. Uh, I, I'm not. Um, because mycoplasma is very commonly found in dogs with upper respiratory disease. And it is one of the pathogens that we know commonly produces disease for which there is no vaccine. So if we can prevent all the vaccine preventable ones, those usual suspects, then the one most often we're probably gonna find is mycoplasma, right? What you don't see is somebody really monopolizing here that's new or novel. Um, these are all the usual suspects and that's what they're positive for. And then you have ones that are negative for everything, but they still have respiratory disease. All right. So there's a lot of reasons for that. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Okay. So that's a little bit of breaking news about what we know. Um, I'm going to, um, stop for just a second and I'm going to ask if we have any, any questions that we think we, we want to address just yet. 
I'm going to ask my 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 colleague, although. Oh, here she is. Do we have any big burning <laughs> questions? Yes. You know, I didn't have a lot of specific questions. I mean, you addressed, of course, Reba. I know Mitchell was asking about whether or not mycoplasma, you know, anyone was saying that it was increasing a lot in the last few weeks. So um, I guess, you know, that wasn't too big of a surprise to see that on the uh, on the data chart, uh, the data yep. set either. Right. So, but, oh, um, you know, I did have uh, and you're probably going to be addressing the later. OK. okay. All right. So, yeah. So, okay. so I'll try to, uh, I'll try question, to cover this. P this is just PCR for dogs, right? It is. I see that from a poultry lover. Yes. This is just PCR for dogs. Sure. The rest are PCRs. Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go with this one um, and I'm going to get to that. I see another question Keep there. Um, I can't see the name, but um, I know someone's asking about, yeah, but some dogs are dying from this. That's very true. Um, but when you have dogs, let's say you have, let's say you have a hundred dogs that, um, a uh, hundred dogs, some percentage of those dogs develop a respiratory infection, an upper respiratory infection. Okay. Let's say 20% of them do some percentage of those dogs, a small percent, you know, maybe, maybe 5% of those are going to develop severe disease, severe, severe illness from that upper respiratory infection. They may even develop a pneumonia. Some percentage of those dogs that develop that pneumonia are going to die from the pneumonia. That is not abnormal. Um, it doesn't it doesn't make it less sad, but it's not abnormal when you're looking at the course of a disease and what we expect to have happen. Which is why it is so important that when you have sign clinical signs of respiratory disease in a dog, that you don't sit on it and you don't wait, right? But the, the number of dogs that have succumbed to respiratory infection that people are trying to loop into an event thus far has not been abnormal. It has not been abnormal. So, okay. Shall, shall we roll with a case? Okay. All right. So, um, and these are cases that are going to be for veterinary and for um, pet care um, analysis, right? So let's say you have a 10-year-old female spayed German Shepherd that presents to the veterinarian, we're going to go with veterinarians first, presents to the veterinarian for anorexia and coughing with maybe some vomiting. The owner's not sure if it's vomit or if the dog is coughing and coughing up stuff, schmutz. Um, five days ago, the dog boarded for the weekend and it received, according to the owner, an unspecified flu vaccine on day one of boarding at the kennel. On physical exam, <clears throat> um, the dog is lethargic, dehydrated. It's got a temperature of 101.8, so no fever. Um, the uh, pulse is 110, rests are 24. And wait a minute, I'm listening. Yep. I think I hear some wheezes on pulmonary auscultation. Maybe, maybe I hear some wheezes. So we get to this as a veterinarian and we say, what are we going to do? We're going to run some blood work. Okay. And I say blood work first, because if you, if you know me as a veterinarian, I'm not the x-ray doctor. I abhor, abhor x-rays. I don't like them, but I do like to run blood work. So you run some blood work and here's what you get. Now, from the veterinary side, for those of you looking at this, that white blood cell count is a little low. So this dog is probably sicker than it appears to be. Um, otherwise, the platelet count, I know that looks low. We don't care. That's It's probably okay because I don't have blood out the nose. Um, and nothing else there is too alarming except the albumin is a little bit low. All of that can be from a sick dog. Okay, you do take some x-rays. Veterinarians, you see an interstitial lung pattern, right? Which is not super helpful. This is also why I don't like x-rays. <laughs> you do some molecular diagnostics. Now, this is the thing everyone's talking about, is doing a PCR on nasal swabs. You send that out, and this dog comes back positive for influenza. 
It's also positive for mycoplasma. Wait, what? Is that fair? Can you have multiple pathogens? Yeah, listen, what we know now that apparently I guess we didn't know up until the last handful of years is that almost all respiratory infections in dogs are multi-pathogen. It is rarely, rarely just one bacteria or one virus causing a problem. It's usually several of them at the same time. So it's no surprise that this dog comes back influenza positive and mycoplasma sinos positive. It was negative for everything else. And you did a culture and sensitivity also. And you found yet another pathogen. You found staph pseudintermedius. Okay, so this dog had a real party happening in its um, respiratory tract. So this dog and this story continued to deteriorate despite aggressive supportive care, despite putting them on fluids, despite putting them on antibiotics, despite making sure that they were eating, whether or not that involved putting in um, an esophageal tube. So after about a week, the dog continued to cough, became depressed, did finally develop a fever. I, apparently I was channeling my inner European because I put the Celsius measurement up there for your fever. Um, it did become hypoxic and had to be placed on oxygen and it did have an increased respiratory rate. So this dog really deteriorated quickly, which is what we can see happen. On necropsy, never a good sign when you're finding stuff out on necropsy, friends. This dog had a lot of hemorrhage, a lot bloody, bloody lungs um, that were really, really diseased. So this is an influenza that just rips through um, the pulmonary tissue of the dog. And the reason that this was so severe is um, could be a couple things um, that flu is never to be trifled with. And the H3N2 is much more um, severe than the, than the other dog flu that runs in the United States. Um, and that this dog may have just had um, won the genetic lotto and its immune system was just really susceptible to severe disease with flu. That happens. That happens in people too. Then you had all those secondary bacterial invaders. You had the mycoplasma that joined in and piled on and you had that staph. And those are really, really difficult to deal with in the face of an influenza um, in a dog. Okay. So right now you're wondering, WIFM. Anybody know what WIFM stands for out there? Well, it stands for what's in it for me? Why are we even talking about this case? We're here to learn about a mystery like pathogen sweep in the country. Listen, friends, upper respiratory illness or infection in dogs can progress to life-threatening infections. Do you remember what this dog started with? And this was a published case. I didn't make this one up to fit my narrative. This is a published case. This dog presented with just a cough. And the cough had only been going on for a couple of days. So even if a dog is just coughing, even outside any new respiratory pathogen, any mystery disease sweeping, you can have a dog that inside of a week deteriorates so radically that it dies from that. And it just showed up with a cough. So everyone needs to take a coughing dog seriously. And also for my friends that are watching this in America, canine influenza is endemic in the U.S. and is a threat even if you don't have an outbreak going on in your area, it's there. Okay, case number two. Listen up, pet care friends, pet care facilities. So you have a one-year-old male standard poodle that's dropped off for boarding. As the staff are walking the dog back to the kennel, it coughs. Have you ever, guys ever had this happen? And it only coughed one time on the way back to the kennel. The owner has left and their car is even out of the parking lot. They've potentially caught the shuttle to the space station. So they're already gone. They have dropped their dog off and evaporated from the planet. Okay. What do you do? What do you do when that happens in your boarding facility? Especially um, in the context of all of the media hype going on. So hopefully... You have a protocol in place where your staff recognizes that dog coughed. We're going to put that dog exactly, Preston. We're actually going to isolate that dog until we know different, right? Yes, Pete, if you were at my lecture this weekend, do not cheat here. Okay, so 
Um, this is your one-year-old male standard poodle. Coughed once, maybe twice at, at intake. Christine, gold star. Christine weighs in. She would isolate that pet. Yes, you would absolutely isolate that pet. So uh, on day two of boarding with that pet, because you're still trying to get hold of the owner, the dog refuses to eat and really just looks kind of a bit off, right? So your staff decides to move it um, really to the isolation area because they just saw heard one cough and apparently it was the new guy. So he didn't notice it and they didn't move it to isolation. So on day two, when it stops eating and looks off, you isolate it. I'm sorry, this is case two, Mitchell. And continue to try and make contact with outer space to get the owner. Meanwhile, the owner of another standard poodle that boards with you calls because their dog is now coughing and they're at the vet and the vet is concerned since they recently boarded with you. And they actually boarded at the same time as the dog that's currently coughing the last time they boarded. Hmm. So now we have two coughing dogs that recently boarded at the same time. Okay, this is difficult. So veterinarians, you're looking at the one dog, the other standard poodle, and you're doing some testing now that you hear there's two coughing dogs that boarded at the same time. You take some x-rays. This is what you find. Chest films are totally normal. Blood work, totally normal. Dog still coughing. But you do take some swabs. <laughs> because you went to that really great integrated CE event on respiratory disease in dogs, <laughs> hosted by PAC. And so you get the owners to agree and you, you send off for PCR. You get that back in record time. And it is canine influenza virus negative. And your bacterial culture and sensitivity are still cooking. Hmm. Okay. So you get the other dog from the kennel and you submit nasal swabs and blood from both of your symptomatic pets. Both of them are negative for influenza. Thank goodness. But here's a little spoiler here also. Just because something is negative on PCR doesn't mean that you don't have the disease. It means you have a negative PCR result. You can have a negative PCR for any, almost any disease and still have disease. You just have a false negative. Okay, especially with flu and dogs. But being the enterprising and investigative veterinarian that you are, you send titers. And then two weeks later, you send another titer. And both of these dogs, well, there's several other dogs involved, but all of the dogs have a fourfold increase in their parent influenza titer. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? They have no change in their flu titer, so the negative PCR on the flu is probably real, but their parent influenza goes up and they have the cleanest dog noses ever because no bacteria are cultured from the swabs that you sent. So in this situation, listen up, because everyone's looking for someone to blame in this case, am I right? We got multiple dogs coughing. We started with two. Then I had four that I had samples for right there. Who's to blame? Is it the boarding facility? Is it the veterinarian? Is it Elon Musk and SpaceX? Because everyone likes to blame him <laughs> for everything on Twitter right now. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Anybody face this? I know I hear all kinds of stories about this, which is one reason that I'm so excited that we have an integrated audience tonight because usually everyone's in their corner, either looking at the floor or pointing at someone else. So who's to blame here? Well, what had happened in this case was, yeah, a dog went to the dog park, friends. Went to a dog park, also known as the cesspool, for all, where all pathogens play, a dog park. And so, there was another dog in the mix, went to the dog park, so did the two poodles. They all met each other and had brief nose to nose contact. And that dog had a housemate that's been coughing and sick and was home. So we had four dogs in the mix, right? 
So neither the veterinarian nor the boarding facility were to blame for this dog getting this. And that is how easy respiratory illness can be transmitted among dogs. Even brief nose to nose contact with dogs that appear to be healthy can provide an opportunity for transmission of respiratory illness among dogs. Okay, so the veterinary mystery is resolved. What you should do as that boarding kennel, you contact the veterinarian of record for the dog that's still boarding. You keep it super isolated. Ask your veterinarian that you work well with about transferring that dog to the veterinary clinic for hospitalization until they're no longer contagious, until the veterinarian says that's okay. And then keep looking for your Star Trek communicator so you can reach the owner, so you can make immediate alternative arrangements for in-home boarding, a pet sitter, transfer to the hospital they like, et cetera. But get that dog up out of your boarding facility as soon as possible um, because you don't want to have any opportunity for an error and a mistake, a break in protocol. Okay, so what's in it for me with this one? The reason that we have protocols is because they're good practice and they're good practice for a reason. They are there to protect us from diseases that we don't even know are out there. Um, brief nose to nose contact with dogs in an unknown situation is a bad plan. Don't be that facility, right? Adhere to your protocols and, and get your staff to recognize the importance of sticking to the way we do things, okay? So this is just a little break here. This is my dog. You saw her. It's Cosette. It's a shameless plug for Cosette. <laughs> and also because I feel like we need a break after heavy cases. Okay. Yeah. What do we have for questions yeah, now? Yeah, of course, sometimes that's good. We need a little cutie Cosette there. So, you know, just to bring up something for a pretty fair part of the audience being um, in-home boarding yep. facilities um, and also dog walkers and pet sitters. Yep. So you had mentioned, of course, you know, contacting those, isolating, getting the dog home, et cetera. So that brings up a lot of different questions here. Um is of course, you know, it, it, some people do private in-home boarding with multiple pets. So that would not be the ideal situation because same exposure problem. Uh, we did have a question whether or not it's really recommended for even very small boutique in-home boarding places to require an influenza vaccination with, mm -hmm. I mean, as you said, it just takes the right nose touching the right nose. Yeah. Um, so, so, here's, so here's I guess a thing. bit of a concern there also. Yeah. So I, I recommend, and and I know our Canadian friends right now, we're going to prickle up and be like, we don't have canine influenza in Canada. And perhaps you don't. Um, but in the United States, for sure, we, we have um, influenza in dogs. It is endemic, which means it's always here. So what is that? What that means is any dog that is at risk for infection with Bordetella, right? And I think we all readily assess that any dog that comes to a boarding facility, sees another dog, leaves their home ever, is at risk for infection with Bordetella. The risk profile for Bordetella and influenza is the same. So if you, so from, so veterinary standpoint first, if I'm recommending an upper respiratory infection vaccination for that dog, then I have assessed that they were at risk for upper respiratory infection, which is the same risk as at risk for influenza. So you should also be recommending the influenza vaccination for that dog as well. Now, if I take it from a boarding facility or a groomer, um, a pet care professional, if I am requiring a um, upper respiratory vaccination for that dog to enter my facility, then I should also be requiring an influenza vaccination. Now, listen, listen, listen. I know influenza vaccine is off the market, on the market, available, not available, all these things. When it is available, you should require it. If it's not available and the owners say, oh my goodness, what do we do? You say, well, I say thank you for vaccinating your dog last year and being up to date, right? That's what you do. So when it's available, you need to require it. Veterinarians, when it's available, you need to recommend it um, because the risk profile is the same. 
I great. Another question we had is, you know, of course, if you're dealing with um, uh, possibly sending them home for in-home pet care, dog walking, pet sitting, any mm-hmm. anytime we have dogs that are potentially coughing in those scenarios, um, what what is the risk level of transferring to the next client home that we go to? What yeah, kind of so, protocols should um, dog walkers and pet sitters be yeah. adhering to? Absolutely. So um, I would, if you know that you're going to be taking care of a pet that's either getting over an infection or um, or even in the midst of one, although I don't think they'd be getting a lot of walking. Um, if they're in the midst of an infection, let's keep them home, walk them out in their yard and put them back. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is um, take care of them last, right? So make them last on your um, schedule. Change your shirt. Anything they get, get schmutz on. So maybe change your pants. You can put on like coveralls or something like this and then take those off um, before you go into another home. You can put on little booties, et cetera. The good thing about influenza is that it's not really good at surviving in the environment. Yes, if it's inside, if it's at room temperature, if it's in its happy place, it can survive for, I don't know, 48 hours maybe. Um, but... UV light inactivates it pretty readily. So being outdoors is great. Um, Soft clothing, it doesn't survive well on soft things. It likes hard surfaces to survive for a long time. But it's still, it's so easy to just change your, change what you're wearing. It's so easy. Um, Wash your hands with soap and water. Do not think that hand sanitizer (laughs) is a replacement for washing your hands. It's not. It makes you feel better. Might make you smell better. No. Wash your hands with soap and water, and then you should be fine. And then you should be fine. Um, so um, I see some other questions about um, vaccines there as well. And we're we're going to talk about vaccines here. So is it all right if I roll through? Um, and then we'll come back if I don't co- pick on. up those questions. All right. Go on. Okay. All right. So Perfect. we're going to talk about CIRDC, Canine Infectious Respiratory Disease Complex now, um, because... Uh, the dogs that are testing positive for something right now, for respiratory disease in the United States in the past 12 months, they're testing positive for either nothing, okay, they're negative, or they're testing positive for sort of the usual suspects in this um, disease syndrome. And so I don't think it's rocket science, and I think um, you, you'll, you'll see some common themes here as we roll through it. Yes, Lisa, peroxide-based cleaners, I love them. They're super safe. Um, the accelerated hydrogen peroxide that's on the market right now is great. And no, I'm not paid by that company. Okay. Listen, these are all of the diseases or the, sorry, the pathogens that we know can produce significant respiratory disease in dogs. Okay. It's a big list and commonly do. These are ones that commonly are found to do it. Now, listen, we can only vaccinate for these. We can't vaccinate for all of them. There's no vaccine available right? So we can only vaccinate for some of them. So then people ask me about this. So if I, if I go back here, uh, some of these that have been known to produce disease in dogs, we can also find in the nose of healthy dogs that have no illness whatsoever, right? So it's a problem because how do we know when it's there causing a problem and how do we know when it's there just hanging out? Well, well, we don't. We know you can find Bordetella in the nose of healthy dogs. Live Bordetella, not dead Bordetella. We know you can find that bacteria. We know you can find coro- oh, coronavirus. We know you can find coronavirus in the nose of healthy dogs, right? We know you can find mycoplasma in the nose of healthy dogs. In fact, it's adapted to survive in the nose of healthy dogs. So... What is happening when these, quote, commensal organisms, the ones that we find there naturally, when they are out of control, running amok, causing disease? Well, they're working together. They have joined the party of bad behavior. And most often, remember I mentioned that um, canine respiratory disease is usually a multi-pathogen affair. It's usually more than one bacteria or a bacteria and a virus. And what we know is that the most common um, pair of pathogens that produces disease that we find most often is mycoplasma sinos 
and canine parrot influenza. We know that the second most common is Mycoplasma canis and parrot influenza. We know the third most common is Mycoplasma and parrot influenza. Are you guys noticing a trend here? We know the fourth most common is para influenza and Bordetella. And then the fifth is Mycoplasma and Bordetella. So the common denominator in the top four combinations that most often produce disease in dogs of any significance includes para influenza. Now, before tonight, how many of you even gave a passing consideration to para influenza? I'll wait. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to wait. But most people, we don't think about para influenza. We think about influenza. They're two different things. But para influenza is a real problem. It, it appears, and I say that because in science, we never say like we know, it appears with strong evidence that para influenza provides some sort of scaffolding or opportunity for the other baddies to make a home and cause a problem. So if we know that to be true, which we do, wouldn't it stand to reason that I would want to prevent para influenza in that dog's nose? Yeah. And another thing, if you can't remember all those other combinations, right? The mycoplasma and parainfluenza, the other mycoplasma, parainfluenza, both mycoplasmas and parainfluenza, parainfluenza and bordetella. What you can remember is that while love is the glue that holds together everything in the world, canine parainfluenza is the glue that holds together CIRDC. That's 100% true, right? We know now canine parainfluenza plays a huge role in the initiation of respiratory tract disease in dogs. So let's go back to our list. And here's the ones we can vaccinate for. And look who's highlighted. It's parainfluenza. Then why are we seeing this problem? Well, because there's different ways you can vaccinate for parainfluenza. So let's say you're going to vaccinate for parainfluenza. You have two choices. Just like these little Frenchies are waiting to hear, you can put that up their nose or you can stick them with a needle, right? So what are you going to do? Well, if you're going to prevent parainfluenza from taking hold, I would argue you want to keep parainfluenza from ever producing any disease in the nose. So no local disease, no mild disease at all, right? The reason is because you want to stimulate what's called mucosal immunity in that respiratory tract, because that's where influenza is going to enter the body is, is in the respiratory tract. So you want to put, if you're going to make a wall, you're going to put it there. And the body already makes that wall. It's called mucus. Okay. So if you have mucus and you have given a mucosal vaccination, you stimulated IgA, immunoglobulin A, right? We've talked a lot about immunoglobulins as a, as a culture, as a country, as a global community in the last few years, because of, we talk about IgG, we talk about antibody titers and we talk about COVID, right? Well, what no one was talking about was IgA. IgA is the um, protective antibody that's found in the mucus of your gut and your uh, respiratory tract. So think of it as IgA in the mucus right here. It's like the water on the slip and slide after you shoot that vaccine up their nose. So now you have mucus containing it. And then you have a virus, a bacteria or a toxin that's about to be sucked up that dog's nose. That's also how I tend to think of all children. Um, so what happens if that virus, that parainfluenza, uh, finds its way into the nose of a dog who's been vaccinated with a mucosal vaccine and up the nose vaccine? Well, here's what's ha what happens. The influenza, parainfluenza comes in. There's a little extra mucus gets thrown on it and he slides off, gets no foothold, sends out no party invitations, doesn't, does not afford mycoplasma or um, the other mycoplasma or Bordetella the opportunity to uh, set up an infection. So by preventing the parainfluenza 
with a mucosal vaccine up the nose, you've potentially headed off a lot of respiratory infection. Okay. So here's the benefit to that mucosal versus an injectable vaccination, because right now, so many of you are uh, thinking, but doc, I vaccinate for parainfluenza every day, all the time, because it's in that combination um, vaccine that we give, right? Whether you call it a DA2PP, a DHLPP, um, that one of those P's in there is parvo, and the other one is parainfluenza, right? So how about that mucosal up the nose versus injectable? One stimulates IgA production, that's the up the nose, and one stimulates IgG. One, the mucosal provides immunity at the port of entry, where that virus first tries to get in. And the other one provides systemic immunity. So one of them, the injectable one, allows for a little bit of colonization and infection in that local tissue before the stormtroopers are activated and they go wipe it out, right? So if you're just using injectable, that's what you get. If you're using mucosal, you have immediate immunity at the local tissue site. The other thing, and this is lovely for people who are behind on vaccines and need to board or groom their dog, the time to immunity or induction of protection is significantly decreased if you put it up the nose. Now, it is not 48 hours. People say that all over the place. That's just wrong. The only one that we have data for is for the Bordetella component of the mucosal one. And we know that in seven days, you have stimulated the immunity or the protection that you're going to get, right? So when you're making your protocols, and you're making these recommendations and requirements, a vaccination two days before they show up at your place is maybe not a good idea. You got to go out a week. Okay. You can give it to puppies, um, even if they're still nursing, because if you do um, a mucosal uh, vaccination, you don't have interference from the mom, from the maternal antibodies, from the colostrum and stuff that they got. No interference. It doesn't matter. You also have a decrease in the duration of shedding of that organism. So if the dog goes to the dog park, sucks up a nose full of pathogens, and then goes immediately to the boarding kennel, you have decreased shedding, right? You also, if they do become infected, because no vaccine is 100%, you have decreased shedding of the pathogen even while they're experiencing clinical signs. So all around, win, 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 winning with a mucosal vaccination, all right? So um, someone wrote in and said, uh, why not do both? Why not do both a mucosal vaccination and an injectable? Thank you very much. Yep, you're picking up what I'm putting down. I do both. I put it up the nose, but I also do that injectable. Okay, here's how that works or why it works, we think. So everywhere you see those letters, um, they did a study, right? And they looked at dogs and they said, is there lymphoid tissue back there? Is there tissue that um, provides uh, um, access for the immune system, right? And they took little biopsies, little chunks of tissue, and they looked at them. And what they determined is that if you look there where you see A and B, A and B broadly have the largest concentration of that immune system tissue. So that's what your target is when you put that up the nose. It's also, we think, why you can be effective with the, um, there's a single oral one that's effective for parainfluenza and it's a mist, it's a spray. And so we think that that's why, but the gold standard for um, immunization against respiratory disease in dogs is intranasal. It's intranasal all week long, four times on a Sunday, it is always intranasal. Um, if you don't have intranasal, you can use the misting one, the oral BBPI but I don't, I use intranasal. Okay, so some key take home points tonight and stay with me, I'm bringing it home and we're gonna just start answering questions till y'all don't wanna hear it anymore. Key take home points about this is that our two cases that we talked about earlier, those poodles um, and that German shepherd, they would have benefited from being vaccinated with an intranasal vaccine, all of them, right? Um, Mucosal vaccines will induce immunity faster than injectable vaccines, and they 
introduce local tissue immunity, whereas the injectable one does not. Mucosal vaccination can be coupled with injectable vaccines. And if you really want to put the biggest bubble or shield around your dog, that's what you would do. So when we're faced with a situation where we have a potential mystery pathogen, a novel disease, I'm not sure that we have that yet. We just don't know. But if we might, guess what I'm going to recommend? I'm going to recommend that you vaccinate, stay up to date with an intranasal upper respiratory vaccine and the injectable influenza vaccine. That, I mean, that, that is the best shield you can put around your dog. Okay. All right. So again, what do we do? Write me out. Don't hide in a box like this cat. Don't do it. Um, pet care facilities, you have got to strictly enforce your vaccination requirements for social events for dogs. It, I don't, I, that, that's whether we have something going on or not. There's a reason that you have those protocols. There's a reason you have those requirements. Stick to your guns because you're protecting the, the herd that, that you have in your facility, not just one dog. Encourage pet owners to have their dog vaccinated with the intranasal upper respiratory vaccine. Talk to your veterinarians. And then the other thing is everyone should keep talking about this. Tonight shouldn't be the only night that we talk about it. Um, my hope is that veterinarians that are on and listening, reach out to your boarding kennels that are around you. Talk to them. Um, answer any questions they might have. Talk about why vaccine protocols and, and what you might recommend. Hey, pet care facilities in your area, reach out to your veterinarians. Talk to them. Um, they probably don't, don't know that you might be interested in talking to them. So yeah, so keep talking about it. Um, information is the antidote to fear, um, in any situation, but most especially in one where we're talking about infectious disease. Okay. Uh, the current mystery. So I'll get back to this here. So we don't know that there is, um, an actual new disease or pathogen. We don't know. There's no evidence yet that there is one. There's none. It looks like it's just regular stuff that all of a sudden the media decided to focus on uh, that some people looked at. Now, right now, someone's probably typing furiously saying, but what about what about that um, place in New Hampshire that found like that new um, bacteria? OK. Take a breath. It's OK. They did find a new potentially novel uh, bacteria. It's a really small one. They're calling it, um, Iola KY. Okay. They found it in a very few dogs that were sick. Um, they found it with a PCR. Uh, they don't know what it means. No one knows what it means. They don't even know if it was producing the disease in those few dogs they found it in. What they know, and they don't, they actually, they, they don't even know if it was viable when they found it because they did PCR. So they don't know if it was a live bacterium. They know they found the genetic material, right? The DNA or RNA of that bacterium. It's myco, um, mycoplasma-like, all right? So, I mean, it's possible it is new, but we are very far from knowing whether or not that produced disease and they didn't find it in every dog that was sick. Yeah, okay. Respiratory infections are really contagious. It is not something that, that you should sneeze at. How do you like that? That's a pun. Um, so you need to communicate with um, your clients, no matter what kind of facility you have, veterinary or pet care, communicate with clients and say, listen, yeah, we're seeing a lot of stuff. We've always been concerned about respiratory disease and protecting your pet from it. Here's what we recommend, right? Um, no vaccine is 100%, none. So I actually uh, recommend to my patients that they, if they are a very social dog, they go to doggy daycares, they routinely board, et cetera. They go to the groomer. Um, oh my God. Whoa. If they go to the dog park, <laughs> I recommend that um, they have uh, the upper respiratory vaccination, the intranasal every six months, right? Even though it's labeled uh, for use once a year, I do it every six months for those dogs that have um, overwhelming exposure. Stick to your protocols, isolate immediately until proven otherwise. Work together with everyone. That's why I'm saying talk. Talk with the other folks in the pet care community in your area. And then consider the source of information when you're talking about diseases, novel pathogens, things like that, anything that scares you, because not every source is equal. And so you need to go find the information yourself. 
Um, and if you have questions, reach out to your community, reach out to PAC, reach out to IBPSA, veterinarians, reach out to your local VMA. Um, I mean, for heaven's sakes, you can reach out to me. I'm on the internet, right? Um, so ask people, don't just sit and worry, 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 and make up recommendations. Okay. So I want to say thank you once again. Thank you all for making time to join us tonight. Um, thank you, IBPSA, for pushing this out to your folks and for um, live streaming it on Facebook. Um, and uh, thank you to PAC uh, for uh, sponsoring this and putting it all together. And thanks again. Merck Animal Health is providing the CE code for those of you who need veterinary CE. Um, there's a link there. Uh, that you can also take a picture um, of the QR code if you want. You need that special code to when you put your information in. If you are watching this on demand and you're not live, this won't work for you. <laughs> so my recommendation is those of you who need this CE, go get your certificate quickly. If you try to get it and you can't get it, you can reach out to me. Um, you can go to my website, drjenthevet.com. Um, you can reach out to PAC. We'll, we'll make sure you get your certificate. Okay. All right. Um, let's. Uh, answer some questions. Let's give give a pack code too. I know you, pack folks are waiting for a code. Yep, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was able to get what they needed there for the uh, for the CE or for veterinary. So here is the code for the pack CEU for all of you that are in the pack, safer in a pack, right? So there is your CEU code to copy down and. Um, Gosh, I thank you so much. There, there are a lot of questions that go through, but then I guess in that next second, you answered them. So, um, but I know, I try, you know, I one of the big things up. I kept saying, you did, you did great. You, I know what I'm like, <laughs> he took my job. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but I really, I, I know one of the big, one of the biggest ones going all the way through is really just how do we bring this home to the pet parents that are really panicking mm -hmm that yep. they just have to stay at home. We can't do anything. Yep. We can't go anywhere. And honestly, it's it's one of the things that we're seeing in, in home services is a huge influx of people panicking because of the media coverage that, well, now I can't take my dog to the boarding facility. So um, yeah. the very oh, bad time God, of the my year. Heart broke. <laughs> my heart broke when I saw some veterinarians. I saw some yeah. veterinarians mentioning in the media, like, don't board your pet. And I'm like, really? I mean, according to everyone, the risk was the same eight months ago as it is tomorrow. You didn't hold back on boarding. Um, but I also, some people need to see the, um, the veterinary CE also they're typing in. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to get that code. It's a little more. Yeah. So, um, so there you go, folks. I know Amy, there you um, go. Not Amy but some other folks have typed in. Um, yeah. And so that's what I'm telling people who are worried. If you have a dog, listen, if you have a dog and I would tell my clients this too, if you have a dog that has pulmonary compromise, you have an asthmatic dog, you have a dog with heart disease, um, et cetera, or you have a brachycephalic dog and mm -hmm. your dog is prone to respiratory issues. Okay. Maybe you want to make a decision to not have your dog be as social um, until this is 100% sorted out. Right now we have no evidence of a novel pathogen, but for dogs in those categories of high risk, like I just mentioned, you should be careful with them anyway. Um, just to take better care of them. Uh, but otherwise, this is a great opportunity veterinarians to reach out to your owners, reach out to clients and say, hey, let's get your dog up to date. Hey, let's let's make sure we're, we're a-okay. Um, you've got an older pet, let's take some thoracic x-rays, right? Like if you've had your dog's had that mitral valve insufficiency its whole life and now that little Pomeranian is 10 years old, let's take some survey radiographs, right? We want to be ready should we find ourselves in a compromised position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Questions. Uh, harmful to give the injection and the nasal at the same time? No, it's totally fine. It's no. totally fine. Here's the mm -hmm. other thing about the mucosal vaccines that's wonderful is that the um, – especially the internasal that's on the market right now, because it has parainfluenza, it has bordetella, and it has adenovirus in it. Um, the great thing about it is that it is um, the adverse reaction to that vaccine, right? The anaphylaxis that everyone kind of lives in fear of. Mucosal vaccines, like I, I can't state that they never produce 
an anaphylactic reaction, but it's really, really, really like, you know, like Jim Carrey, like one in a million. Okay. You're telling me there's a chance, right? Um, it's really, really, really <laughs> unlikely. Um, the risk is higher with, with injectable vaccines. So yeah, so it's totally safe to give both at the same time. Okay. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of stories here of people really, really being challenged by this right now. So um, is there, do you know of any like uh, comprehensive media coverage that is coming from a body of veterinarians to better educate the public? Or um, are we unfortunately just being held captive to the hype? Listen, it's coming from PAC right now. This is what's happening, right? Oh, well, yes. <laughs> okay. So look, there's going to be links to this video. And if you have pet owners that are concerned or what have you, they're engaged enough, go send them a link. Send them a link to this on the Facebook page for IVPSA and for PAC, because these are entities who don't really have a dog in the hunt. Do you like that pun? They don't have a dog in the hunt. They're not looking to sell you something or whatever. We are just ah. providing, right? We're just providing information. And if you follow the data and you trust data, then you it can help mitigate some of that discomfort and that anxiety and fear. Um, so um, I, I, mm -hmm. I feel like pet owners that are reading the media and are concerned and engaged at that level of their pet's care, because they, most of them are, um, they're willing to, to listen to um, some information about it, right? Um, and so I would protect against the stuff we can protect against. Don't make stupid decisions, right? Um, assure pet owners that you adhere to protocols to prevent the transmission of disease. And that's all we can do. And and then you got to make your decision. Yeah, that's true. Let's see. Or CE, let's see. David, oh, David, yeah. no, 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 David me, asking, were you asking for the veterinary CE? Yeah, let me, I think I can post that link. Can you push that out? You might be able to. Yeah, let me, let me, um, let me bring it up. Hold okay. on. Yep. <laughs> So hang on and I'll put that link in the um, in the chat. That's a good idea. I didn't even think about that. First, I have to go get it. Hold on. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Jennifer, question. Uh, question from Jennifer. Class of antibiotic that's showing more positive results than others? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I'm just putting that CE link in the chat for those of you who want to uh, pop it for veterinary CE. Um, okay. Uh, oh, and the code. I guess we do like if we want to put the hopefully you guys got the code we could put the code back up there I suppose. Um, I'll put the code in the yeah, chat. Also. You would need Hold to share. Hold on, I'll just put the code in there. Okay. Hold on. Perfect. Okay. There's the code. Um, yeah. So back to the antibiotic. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, so what's interesting about um, <laughs> antibiotic use is that uh, because we know it's multi-pathogen, even if I think that your dog has a viral infection. I'm probably going to send home um, antibiotics and something for the cough because the cough not, is not helping anybody. Um, 20 years ago, our first line antibiotic choice would probably have been a penicillin. Um, now, most of us are um, switching and we use doxycycline because mycoplasma, um, which is commonly found, as you saw, in mm -hmm. many um, respiratory infections in dogs, mycoplasma is inherently res uh, resistant to penicillins. Because it like for a number of like it doesn't have a cell wall like it's got like all these characteristics about it that it's automatically um, not going to be but it is susceptible to doxycycline so don't look at your doctor like they have two heads if they send home doxycycline first first line choice for that um, and uh, the other thing is um, part of the reason that it's difficult to determine what's causing like this event, if there is something is because we don't test, usually we don't test at the initiation of an infection with a dog, right? If you think about um, pet owners, the dog coughs a couple times one day, they notice it, okay? Good ones notice it. They don't go to the vet that day. The dog's mm -hmm. usually been coughing for two or three days. 
before they come to see the vet or before they even think of making an appointment, right? Then they get in to see the vet. Maybe it's, they couldn't take them that yet. next day. So you got five days now and they're, they're still coughing. And, um, Ooh, uh, Lena, hold on. I'm going to get to your question too. That's a good one. Um, so it's been coughing for five days. If that initial infection was with something like, um, Oh, okay. Coughing for five days finally shows at the vet. We don't usually test right off the bat. It's expensive and pet owners don't usually say yes. So a lot of times we're only testing dogs after mm -hmm. they've still been sick for a while. And so if parrot influenza was the one that caused the problem initially, it's long gone and we're just left with the bacteria having the party, right? And the same can be true for influenza or any other virus, any other viral infection, they're usually gone or at least they're not shedding them in high enough numbers that the PCR is going to pick it up in a consistent way. So, um, so it's very difficult when we're trying to, to identify something like this in dogs. Um, so I, I did, I love the question. Someone asked about um, Paxlovid. So I did see like just yesterday, I actually saw an, mm -hmm. an article about people using Paxlovid in dogs. Please do not use Paxlovid in dogs. Please do not use Paxlovid in dogs. It, it works very specifically on a very specific enzyme um, that coronaviruses have. And I mean, it's a pretty well conserved um, component of the viral replication process in the cell, but it's unnecessary. And we're not seeing coronavirus in dogs. Um, we're, we're, we're not, right? So um, not, not in, in big numbers, et cetera. And it doesn't produce severe illness. So please do not use Paxlovid in dogs. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm not it sure what sounds else. Sounds like COVID. It's we're just chloramphenicol. People are talking about chloramphenicol. Yeah. Chloramphenicol is an interesting drug. Um, it's not one we reach for right away because of all the things associated with it. Um, it can have some bad side effects. It's not great for humans to be exposed to it. Um, so we have you wear gloves, etc. And um, anyway, so yeah, if your veterinarian is prescribing chloramphenicol, it's because they've done some further diagnostics that are driving that choice. Um, so if you, I don't think chloramphenicol is a good first line choice. <laughs> yeah, in general. Good, good. Um, a lot of questions from people wanting to know if they can get the link to share with people. So, um, so Jennifer, I see yours. I've seen other people asking about it. Uh, so you can share this recording from the original link that you registered at. Additionally, it is going to be on the PAC YouTube page uh, once we download that. So of course, go in and subscribe there. And then if you are on the Facebook page for PAC or for IBPSA, um, you'll have it there available also, but probably easiest once we get it up on the YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, I Let's like, see. I see the chat has... questions back in there. I know there's, there's, I was just going to say the chat seems to be slowing down. So I think people Sorry, are, I was... yeah, I know we, we've still got over 200 people watching though. I can tell on this end. So people are hanging in with you here, Dr. <laughs> okay. Jen, you got it going on tonight. So okay. um, I'm going to ask this question here from okay. a dog walker, um, yep. a dog walker asking about, you know, honestly, just walking dogs in neighborhoods where these uh, respiratory illnesses are prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, is there, you said that, of course, the virus typically likes the soft surfaces mm -hmm. being outside. Is there a concern if dog comes through in the morning who yep. is shedding uh, knots or whatever fun word you used um, yep. in the grass and dog comes a couple hours later exposure? Yeah. Um, so that's a great question. That's a great question. So basically is um, uh, like, I'll, I'll distill that question down because it's a, it's, I, and not not in a bad way, but just kind of in a let's recognize what we're talking about here is that is it safe to walk your dog outside? Um, yes. In fact, it's most safe to walk your dog outside. Um, is it possible that your dog comes into things that can produce illness when you're on a walk through the neighborhood, even if you don't ever come in contact with another dog? Yes, of course it is. 
right? I mean, we didn't even talk about Lepto tonight, which is one of my faves. But yeah, every puddle um, they come into because wildlife go through our neighborhoods now. Um, the urban raccoon is real, okay? Um, other dogs. Can we mention cats? Um, so there's a lot. And, and then you have migratory birds. Like there's all kinds of things that your dog can be exposed to. However, most of them are not going to produce disease in your dog. Most of them are not going to produce disease in you, right? So my recommendation for a safe walk with your dog, and if you're a dog walker, I would adhere to these things, protect, protect other people's dogs. I would make sure they're vaccinated. I know that it seems weird and a little counterintuitive for a dog walker, but you're going to be taking that dog out into the world. So you don't want to be the one responsible for them getting sick when they could have, and it could have been prevented. So make sure they're vac up to date on their vaccines. Make sure they get routine monthly preventives in the way like, um, like Co Cosette is on Sentinel Spectrum once a month for heartworm and gastrointestinal parasite prevention. And then also the ectoparasites, right? I do love me some Brevecto, not being paid by them. I'm just telling you what my dog is on. Um, but and the monthly preventives are helpful as well. And then in addition to that, don't let them do gross stuff, right? Don't, don't let them go like roll in poop or something. I mean, this is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. If they do, right? Because I mean, I had working dogs and when they run through the cow pasture, I'm not running with them. But then when we got home, I bathed them. I rinsed them off at a minimum, right? Because they had gross stuff on them. So yeah, yeah. So you can do it. But be reasonable in your approach and use information as that antidote for your anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Merit, Merit just said, we teach dogs not to sniff as a trainer and it being a secondary health prevention technique. <laughs> right? Great. Merit, love it, I love, love that. I, okay. I don't know if I'm a little offended that you didn't think of it as like a health prevention thing, but good on you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, Eve's question on there. Uh, um, any tips for when we call the vets to ask what they're seeing and they say keep all dogs home? besides sharing this. <laughs> um, so any other tips? That's tricky. So um, it kind of depends on how you want the conversation to flow. Cause I know that's difficult. Um, especially if you're a non vet, um, that can be a difficult conversation. So my recommendation would be if you're calling and say, Hey, um, you know, can, can we meet? I'd like to have a conversation about what's going on right now, et cetera. And they might say no. And you say, okay, well, um, what we're hearing from the veterinary professionals that we talk with, because you're talking with me right now, see how that works, um, is that this really isn't a mystery disease. It's just the usual suspects and infectious respiratory disease complex. Um, so, uh, we'd like, we'd like to chat with you about that. It's, we're telling our, we are sending our clients to you to get the intranasal vaccine so we can protect from those usual suspects, all those things. But in the end, you cannot tell somebody something that they don't want to hear from you. Um, but you know, may, maybe, maybe you would, could help drive some educational opportunities in their area. That's true. And I mean, especially your, your comment of saying that this is what we're recommending to our clients that come to you to come to you to get this additional vaccination protection. Right. Yep. Yes. Perfect. Um, Laura has a question on here about the certification. I'm not sure how the, uh, the, the code goes, uh, trying to get certification. It's sending me to Merck. Yes, because Merck is providing the CE sure you... um, approval for this. So yes, it's going to send you to a Merck site. You put your information in and then you'll get your certificate at the end. It'll populate your certificate. Okay. And, I think and then can, Chantal, can, I guess. You can put your information in and get a, um, a certificate, even if you're not a veterinarian, because it's also good for technicians. It's good for pet care providers. It's good for what ails you. Go get a CE certificate. It's okay. <laughs> 
So it is not exclusively veterinary CE. No, no. Perfect. No, no one has the monopoly good. on I'm education. Oh, well, that's good. I like that. Awesome. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. That is a groomer question. Um, I don't know if you see that uh, at the groomers, could dogs get the virus by the blade and shears when they are around the face and nose area? Yes. It's I would possible. assume they're sanitized in between. Yeah. It, I mean, Anything is possible, please. I'm I do I'm not issuing a challenge. Okay. Like don't consider this a challenge. Um, but that's why it is also so important. And I think that, you know, the the pack, the pack standards, the pack certification, and understanding all of these protocols and how all of these things fit together to provide that standard of care at your facility and for the pets that you're working with, I think addresses those issues. So that if you're adhering to you know, sort of the industry standard, you don't need to worry about whether or not this is transmitted on blades and clippers because you're already adhering to protocols that prevent that, right? And so that's one of those great reasons to look into PAC certification. Mm -hmm. If you're a groomer, if you're a um, kennel operator or kennel staff, because it provides that extra level of comfort that you understand what's going on and your role as part of the pet care team. Yes, that is true. Best practices. It's good to have those, right? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, you can, Kylie, okay. just put NA or 000 oh, on your license code. You don't have, just put, put something. It won't matter if you don't have a license. Just put something in there so that it'll populate and you can get your certificate. No, um, Susan, the license code is for veterinarians or okay. um, veterinary technicians who are in a state that licenses them or certifies them. You could put that in there. But honestly, put in whatever number you want, really, um, because it is a certificate that just reflects that you were here and participated. Yes, 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 yes. And we're talking about dogs, Janie. So why is there a cat on your lap? Put that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, ooh, my Mr. Bigglesworth here, right? But he has hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, just try to keep him out of the camera screen. He's a total camera hog. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Um, let's see. Yes, Kira would love to to see you as part of the pack, but um, go back and rewatch this. There's great information in there about the the vaccine vaccinations that uh, Dr. Chatfield recommended. So, yeah, go back and watch yep. the replay, and you'll get that information. Very good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, if you, any I would other, say, I guess any if, other fresh if you cannot, if you can't get your certificate, because um, I think Kylie is still struggling with that a little bit. If you, if you don't get an email link or something like this, or get a certificate and you need one, email me at um, info at uh, drjenthevet.com um, and I will help you. And I hope I don't get like 500 emails, but if you can't get it, I want you to get it. Um, so you can email me at info, like information at drjenthevet.com, drjenthevet.com. So Perfect. I think little uh, that, side question, any vitamins or supplements that will help boost immunity? Yeah. Um, keeping your pet healthy at all times helps boost immunity, making sure that their GI system is healthy because we know 70% of our, our estimates are 70% of the immune system is contained in the gut, which is pretty interesting. That's a whole other conversation that I find fascinating. Um, so uh, making sure that you don't have a dog that has soft stool all the time, because that means you're feeding them wrong or not feeding them as well as you could. And they may have some chronic inflammation happening. So, you know, a good probiotic. Um, everybody knows I like full bucket. Again, I'm not paid by them, but I like full bucket veterinary supplements. Um, there are some other supplements on the market that you can look at for immune system. 
as long as you're feeding your dog a complete diet and they have good stool, they don't have a lot of gas, they don't have soft stool, et cetera, um, that you can, you can try to correct that with uh, probiotics like full buckets. Um, I think you're okay. Um, you really shouldn't have to supplement their diet too much because they're comp it should be a complete diet. If you're feeding one of the commercially available dog foods, like from the big companies like Purina, Hills, Royal Cosette eats Royal Canin, right? Um, then, then you should be fine from a health and nutrition standpoint. If you are concerned, if you have a dog that you think is having a problem, you actually can get a consultation with a veterinary nutritionist. Um, they may not even need to see your pet in person. So you can reach out for a remote consultation. Dr. Joe Walkschlag is a friend of mine who's a veterinary nutritionist. I trust him. So he's a good one. Okay. Um, I think this has popped up. Dogs with PLE. Brian had asked that uh, like question. A, is, is that protein losing enteropathy? Is that what you're asking about? You'll have to clarify for me. So I make sure we're talking about the same acronyms. And yes, Denise, full bucket. Um, if you put in, um, I don't know if it's full bucket health, but it's full bucket veterinary supplements. If you put that in. Oh yeah. Protein losing enteropathy. Um, are you concerned about that for the vaccine, Brian? Or are you concerned about that for overall GI health or health? Um, let me know in the chat, but any dog that's got um, a chronic underlying illness, like a protein losing enteropathy, we naturally presume to have a decreased immune function. Maybe that's accurate in some cases and maybe it's not, but it's safer when they have that to presume that they are in, at some degree at all times immune compromised. And so I would be more cautious about them um, in social settings, no matter what, even outside of this current situation. Oh, just overall with the protein mm -hmm. level. Um, if you're just Wonderful. concerned about it. Yeah. Oh so my goodness. That's, Apparently my cat is telling me. Um, that really is a question for a nutritionist. So you could measure, have your vet measure the protein level. If you are a vet, measure the protein level. Um, they may need to take in more. But some pets who are suffering from that, they, they just are not going to absorb anymore. So you may have to do other things. But again, that is that is 100% a nutritionist's um, lane for them to work with you at. But yeah, so I I don't see any more questions for me coming in. I do love the conversation that's happening though. Thank you, Merritt, for rolling up on that with the the training and the environmental enrichment and all of that. Yes. This has been great. Um, yeah, I think we'll wrap up. My goodness, we have, we've gone an hour and a half here. This has been an amazing amount of information that you have shared with all of us. And uh, I know here I've seen so many people say that they have appreciated this so much. And uh, we thank you from PAC for giving us this opportunity to put this out there with you. Um, of course, uh, you know, everyone that has been able to participate and that is also watching the replay. This is good information for us to all really get out there and try and make a difference in uh, everything that has been spread in the media and, and try to get, uh, get a little bit more education out there for our pet parents and additionally protect them no matter what the respiratory thing is going around right now. Yep. Yep. Appreciate so, that. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Night. Looks so good. Getting lots of thank yous here. So yes, everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank